Welcome and thank you everybody for uh, showing up. This is uh, one of the classes I'm doing in a series kind of aimed at uh, getting people started in woodworking, building skill sets and toolkits for uh, primarily reenactment purposes. Um, I am Baron Alastair McRobert. I'm from uh, the Barony of Glenmere in the Kingdom of uh, Ontier. I have been uh, doing woodworking for roughly, uh, well, since I was pretty small, but primarily focusing on uh, reenactment uh, usages and uh, historical create recreations since about 20 years now. So I've been doing it for a while. My focus is varied. Um, I, I do a little of this, a little of that. These were primarily started and focused because I saw a lot of people asking questions. Well, I, I want to do it, but where do I start? Or I've got this amount of money. What are all the tools I should buy? Or, oh, I could never do that. And there is some complexity. It does take some time to develop the skills, but there are very few things that you are not capable of doing if you put a little bit of time and energy into it. And also there are a lot of tools that people will run out to buy. They'll see them on shows or they will see them on videos. And they'll see them like, oh, I've got to have that if I'm going to do this. And there's a lot of times that it's nice to have that tool, but it is not necessary. There are many, many other ways that you can go about accomplishing the goal that you're trying to do, especially if it involves power tools. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and hopefully through this with, with a minimal investment, and a lot of times there are ways you can use the tools that you might already have to get the job done without having to go out and buy a whole lot more stuff or devote a large amount of space. Um, as you can kind of see behind me, this is about a third of my shop. I, I have an entire two-car garage converted over, full of tools, full of stuff. But most of the stuff I don't use very often. It's, it's just really not necessary for what I'm doing. It's just kind of, ooh, that was shiny, so I bought it. So um, I encourage feedback. I would love to hear from you. And if you have any questions or comments or suggestions for uh, future episodes and things to cover, please shoot me in line, let me know. Um, and I'd love to see what you guys create and come up with. And I'm, I'm always happy to talk shop. So in this case, uh, on our last video, uh, one of the comments was made um, in making more early period stuff, not quite so later. I tend to do 14th century. Um, Her Excellency, our, our lovely host, Disa is, uh, Mistress Disa, excuse me, um, is an earlier period. She's a, uh, a, a Viking age Swede. Um, so she's doing 10th century. If I get that right, I always get it back and forth if it's ninth or 10th. Um, century, I, you're correct. I always, I get hit in the head a lot. So, you know, numbers slip sometimes. Um, but looking more towards that time period, it, it's harder the farther back you go to find examples because things just don't survive. Uh, we're talking about natural products made of wood, and they just, they break down over time, they get lost, they burn, they get rotted, they just don't have the longevity. So the farther go back we go, it's the harder it is to document it. Uh, earlier in this series, I did a class on your standard six board box. And when you get right down to it, most of the Scandinavian style boxes really are a six board box with a few regional touches to it. Most notably, they are angled. Um, the sides are not 90 degree angles. Usually there's a slight angle to it. It varies from place to place. Um, I, I've heard a lot of different conjecture as to why that may be. Some people point out, well, you know, if you slope the sides, it makes them easier to stack on top of each other. Uh, personally, I subscribe more to the theory that the sloped sides make for a more stable base especially if you are taking them around, if they might be on shipboard, uh, it, you have a more stable base because you have a wider base and you have a top, so you're not as likely to tip over or fall. Um, but whatever the case may be, it's a pretty defining feature. <clears throat> this is what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, this is made, I, I've kind of gone back to some of the beginnings that we did with the earlier classes. This is made out of a one by 12 pine board. They're pretty, pretty easily found in most of your, uh, your big box stores. You can also find them in smaller lumber yards. Um, and usually if you can find a dedicated lumber yard, 
um, or a dedicated building center, you'll find them a lot cheaper. Case in point, these were a, a, a one foot wide by, or excuse me, one inch thick, 12 inch wide, uh, eight foot board. And it went for $18 at my lumber center versus the same board going to one of the big box stores goes about 22, which five bucks is not really a big deal. But when you figure that I needed two boards per box, now we're looking at 10 bucks, but I also wanted to make two boxes. So now I'm looking at 20 bucks, which is effectively another board. And that's just for softwoods. That's not for the hardwoods that you start going up and your board foot prices, um, you can really, really rack them up if you're not careful. But we've also talked about that on another sub story or on another episode. So we'll go on from there. So this box is not an exact reproduction of a specific box. It is more built in a style consistent with some of the other boxes. Uh, in this particular case, some of the headby boxes. One of the things you'll notice is it has iron nails on the corners. These are a modern reproduction wrought uh, head nail. Uh, you can buy them from uh, you can get them on Amazon. You can buy them at Rockler, which is a, an online woodworking uh, tool and supply store that I go to a lot. And they do a pretty good job as a commercially made product to replicate a period feel for those of us who don't have access to forging equipment. And uh, they're also a lot cheaper than buying through handmade nails. So this one and we is, can and, and really quickly, we can provide those links uh, in the blog post for the for the class. The link. Yeah. So one of the things you'll notice it's a little bit different is if you can see here, it is actually got a, uh, a through tenon here. It is sticking into the side. It, there is a, a mortise in the side of the, the box and the base itself has a tongue that sticks out a, a tenon into that base, which is pretty characteristic of all of the Scandinavian boxes that I've seen from that period in time. One of the other things, and you can kind of see here as well, there's a gap there by my thumb. That is not because I screwed up on, on my cut uh, completely. It is actually because there is a shallow rabbit on the edges of the front and uh, the back that actually cause the base to fit into it. And the benefit of that, I don't know if you'll be able to see this in here, is there is no gap there that you can see. Since the base actually sticks out a little bit into the side, it makes for a very smooth joint on that side there. And you have less likelihood of smaller stuff falling through. So as I said, this is not an exact copy. It is made more in mind with the lumber that I can get. One of the other things is most of the Scandinavian boxes that I've looked at are um, of a piece. They are not pieced together. So this entire width here needs to be a single piece of wood in keeping with that style. That is a lot more difficult for us. Trying to find modern lumber that is that size, this is actually a glued up piece. So in this particular case, this one is uh, 11 and a quarter inches which is just about what the finished dimension on the box is. That came about not because uh, of the thickness of the wood, but because I screwed up my measurements a little bit. It should have actually been longer. To actually truly go with the headby style, the front of this would have gone pretty much down to the bottom of the wood, and there would be an arc cut in the front instead of the feet sticking out like that. Um, I got ahead of myself and I cut something I shouldn't. So I salvaged it. Now it's a little bit more like one of the Oathberg boxes instead of the headby, but we'll talk about that. So um, if you wanna go ahead and bring up that first picture. Absolutely, just one moment. Okay, so this is the actual headby box. It was found in a harbor. Uh, if you look at the front of it there um, on the picture on the, well, I guess it's my left, I'm not sure if you have the same side. Um, you'll notice there's a hole in the front of it. Um, and the, uh, the belief is this is there was a lock plate there that has been broken off. And so this was probably something that was stolen. 
it was uh, stolen, the lock plate was broken off so that people could get in and get to the contents of it, and it was pitched overboard. The picture on the right actually shows it at the bottom of the harbor where it was found upside down and submerged. And if you look at the front of the box in the picture on the left, you'll notice that unlike my box, the side plate goes all the way down. It gets almost touching the ground. And that is, is a little bit more common of, uh, of this particular style that we're seeing here. The, the other boxes that we're gonna talk about, some of the Osberg fine boxes as well as the Mastomere box, uh, tend to have the feet like I've got on my recreation here. But uh, the Headby ones and some of the others that I've seen similar, they tend to go down farther. So in a way, there's a bit of a waste of lumber there because the base of the box is actually set higher up. There's a couple of inches that is nothing behind that front, just open air, but it is of the style of the box. I'm not sure exactly why it was done that way, um, but it just seems to be pretty common. And there's a bit of a curved uh, arc to the bottom of it as well. It's a little bit more decorative. And also if you just got those two feet on the ends, again, it's a lot more stable than trying to get all four pieces to sit uh, you know, flat on the ground like that. Um, the other thing you'll notice, the top of this and actually most of these boxes is not flat like I've got. It's actually curved. And then the inside of it is hollowed out. So it maintains a, uh, a common thickness throughout, but it's more of a trough shaped. I'm not entirely certain why. I know from an agricultural or a kitchen usage point, I've seen boxes that are similar to that, that the lid is used for doing dough and things like that on. But I can't really picture you'd be making bread dough on top of on the top of a box that you'd have locked shut. It, um, so it, it's it's a stylistic choice. The rounded top is a little bit more comfortable to sit on as opposed to this flat top with the 90 degree corner. But it's not nearly as conducive to being able to stack them for transport or for uh, you know for setting things down on top of it. Um, you can just barely see on the picture on the left, there's a couple of iron hinges that are on the top of that box. They're just kind of protruding a little bit from the top. Uh, those are, uh, there are pictures of them. I, I, something I'm working on is another project that I might get to someday. Um, but the, uh, the East Kingdom Blacksmith Guild actually has a video on making Mastomere style hinges. It's a really good video and I, I recommend it to you if you, uh, if you happen to have an interest in uh, taking that particular dive. I'm gonna go to the next one. And so now this is an actual picture of the, of the box. Uh, it is in the museum. You can see it's been cleaned up a little bit. Uh, again, it, it's pretty badly damaged. You can see there's holes here and there and there's been marks. There's also, if you look really closely, it looks like there might be some trace of possibly decoration on the front. It might've been carved a little bit. Um, a lot of these have some you know, in them. Um, a lot of the stuff that we, we find, the decoration doesn't hold up as well because it's usually fairly shallow and these get scuffed, beat up. I mean, this was in the bottom of the harbor for a while. But again, you can see a little bit more of, of the detail and the angles there on how it goes together. Next one. Now, this is a little bit different. This is actually one of the Osberg boxes. And you can see there's a lot of iron work on this one. There are multiple uh, latches on the front. There are, is strap work that have been riveted onto the thing. But it is also, it has that, uh, that exposed foot, you know, the end boards that have come down to become feet on either end, closer to what I'm making uh, here. But if you look really closely, you'll notice even here, it's a much shallower curve, but the lid on this is still slightly curved. And the, the lighting is not great, but it does still, some of the line drawings I've seen shows that it does have that, uh, the, the board, the baseboard is grooved into the, the sides to help support it and there's multiple hinges of it on the back. This one has a much different profile where the headbee chest seems to be um, a little bit more, uh, it's taller, it has more depth to it as well as more width. The, this Osberg box and most of the rest of them we're gonna be looking at are very long and very narrow. They don't have nearly the interior volume, volume that we do. 
And I don't know if that's a stylistic choice, if it was just a particular use it was in, or if it might happen to reflect the availability of the longer lumber that they may or may not had at the time, uh, or the wider lumber, excuse me. Go ahead, next one. And that is the same box actually in color. Actually, I believe this is a reproduction of that particular box. Again, you can see all of that strap work and the rivet work on there. This would have been a very heavy box, a very strong box. Whatever they put in there with the multiple locks, it would have been something they wanted protected really well. Uh, but it's a, it's a beautiful box and it's, uh, it's something I've considered recreating. I, I think I could figure out how to make the straps uh, and, and hammer them out to the right width, but uh, it's, it's down the road for me a bit. Next. So now this is actually another of the Osberg boxes. This one, or wait a minute, no. Yes, I'm sorry, this is another of the Osberg boxes. This is one of the few that I've seen that has that depth like the, the head B box does. It has a lot bigger area inside. Uh, and again, I'm not entirely certain why it's so different than the other one. Could just be the fact that we've got different, uh, different uses or different areas or you know, they, maybe they picked it up along the way somewhere. It's hard to say. But again, we're looking at very similar characteristics with all of these boxes. They have those slant sides coming up to the top and that curve, uh, curved top to them. Next. Now, this is probably one of the most famous ones that uh, anyone in the SCA uh, is familiar with. This is the Mastomere box. And the Mastomir box was found, as I recall correctly, in a field. A farmer was plowing and came across it. And this one was found and it was full of just a treasure trove of tools for both blacksmithing and also carpentry. Whether or not the individual who owned it did both of those or was producing those tools for someone else is anyone's guess. But it gave us a really good look into a, a complete Viking Age tool chest. And again, it's very long and very narrow. Um, it is, especially in this particular case, um, if you're holding a lot of weight, having that wider boards means that there's, they're more flexible, they're light more likely to, uh, to, to bend or to bow on you. And if you're transporting this around, carrying that weight, that narrower box is gonna be a lot easier to keep, to carry it close to your body and keep it closer to your center of gravity. Um, if you see on the, uh, the lid there, you can see a darkened band where there was at least one hinge. Um, and then on the box itself, you can see there's a little tab sticking up on the back from the other hinge. The hinges made from, from this spine consist of a, a, piece of a flatter piece of iron that has had a hole put in one end and then it's enlarged out. So then the piece on the top is a narrower piece that forms a loop and hooks around it. So you get kind of like a, a tab and ring um, arrangement to allow it to rotate. It's, uh, it has a little bit more forgiveness, especially for some of those who are just starting uh, than trying to do like a little, later buried, uh, barrel hinge does. I think that's the last one, isn't it? Uh, no, I believe there's uh, another, another photo, okay. but... Um, but we did have a question. Um, what are the weight capabilities of the boxes? And I asked for clarification for holding or for sitting on, and they said both. They were curious as to both. Um, that is gonna depend a great deal on what you make the box out of um, and the size of the box you make. If, if you are looking at, uh, like, I mean, these are the one I'm doing here, I'm using pine because it's cheap. And in this particular case, um, I've been doing a lot of these classes and they're starting to kind of head up in, uh, in the material. And I'm also kind of figuring out the pattern. I haven't done this particular box uh, in these particular um, dimensions before, but this box, uh, it, it's pine, it's finished dimensions, it's uh, three quarters of an inch thick. I have never heard of uh, any of them collapsing under weight from being set on. Um, I've had some fairly prosperous individuals uh, sit on them with not so much as a squeak. As far as the weight capacity they have for carrying them, um, I don't know, I've never had one fail. You've got the long grains of the wood that are going through the sideboards of the box. 
and that adds a great deal of strength. Um, some of the boxes actually have nails going through the face of the box into the base, some don't, and that will also increase the strength of your box. And of course, we've got modern adhesives that you can put in there and nobody will know they're there, but that will also increase the weight of the box. Unless you are carrying some truly, truly heavy gear, and I would not take this pine box and pack it to the brim full of lead, uh, in part because I couldn't lift it, but um, I, I would be concerned about that. But you're looking at the, those, those slanted sides. Not only do they give you a great deal of stability, but they also give you a lot more strength because they're, they're distributing the weight out pretty good. I hope that answers the question. If, if you're worried about weight for using them, I'd go with a hardwood. Um, you can go with poplar is a, 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 it's more expensive than pine, but it's not super uh, pricey. Uh, but to be honest, in my neck of the woods, I'm in Washington state. And um, the price for me to buy a poplar board versus an oak board is not substantially different. So I'd go ahead and just do the oak. We cover that then? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was I was answering a question. Um, no problem. We had someone ask if they should make an education uh, donation for supplies, which is very kind. But um, uh, most of the things we're either using for our camp or um, um, or these boxes we may actually be selling later. Um, uh, Alistair actually has a a a, a business. Um, Facebook page, AMR Woodcraft, um, where he sells a lot of items. So, um, so we, we are fine, but thank you so much for the offer. That's very kind. Um, so let me move to the next picture here for you. Okay, now this is the Mastamere box. And again, it's, uh, it's been exploded with line drawings, how it all went together. And if you look at it, you can see, again, we've got that top. And uh, it, it's a curved top, it's a lot thicker. It's about two to three times the thickness of the rest of the boards of the box because you're also gonna be hollowing it out. One of the other reasons that I chose not to go that particular route, aside from the fact that I pack everything and try and get it tightly, is because I don't have the tool that I need for it and I didn't wanna try and take the time to chisel it out. For doing something like that, my, my tool of choice would be using a small ads and that's, that's a skill set I don't have yet. So there are a number of other things that I could do to replicate that. I can mark out my area. I can use a chisel and a, and some, uh, and a small circular saw and I can score it and break it down and then chisel it smooth to try and keep it. But it really, I'm not quite willing to go that route for this project. Uh, down the road, when I do it in Oak, I might actually try it for authenticity sake, but uh, I kind of decided to forego that one just for, for ease for, the, for myself and for this class. And I was running a little late. But again, here, this was a tool chest. It held a lot more. So as to that question about weight, if you look at the line drawing on the very bottom of this, you'll notice those round spots on the front of the box. And those are actually from nails that were used to hold the front to the base to keep the base from sagging down. So again, you can, you can reinforce it if, if you uh, choose to do so. If you don't want to go into the nails, you can uh, go with dowels. That is another way to go, and it is a cheaper and easier way to go. It's not as correct, and it's not going to be as strong, but it really comes down to a combination of you know, what you're going to put into the project. And it creates a perfectly serviceable box. I have done it myself numerous times. And I kind of prefer the look of the dowels. It also works a lot better for getting, you know, for, for storing because you don't have these nail heads sticking out and uh, you, you don't, uh, that are then gonna tear up other things. And it also works really nicely because the dowels can go in, you drill the hole, it seals in there. You don't have to worry about splitting or cracking, which even with pre-drilling, sometimes you have problems with that with nails. So, Okay, uh, I think we kind of covered all that. So let's get into the actuality here. The project that I have here is based on doing a 12 inch board, which if you go to the lumber store and you buy a board, everything is nominal. So when it says it's a one by 12 by however long, 
your length is going to be pretty much spot on, maybe a little bit over, maybe a little bit under, but not much. But when they tell you it is a one by 12, that is the raw size. That is before it has been thicknessed down to a flat finish thickness and width as well. Usually you're gonna lose uh, some, some of the, uh, in there, about three quarters of an inch, uh, or to half inch to three quarters of an inch in the width. So if it's a 12 inch board, you're gonna end up with an 11 and a half to 11 and a quarter board, depending on what you're buying and where. And in this case, it says it's a one inch board. And I honestly didn't even look at it. So this is a one inch board. I lost a quarter inch of my thickness. So my one, my one by 12 is actually 11 and a quarter by three quarter. So keep that in mind, your drawings, you know, sometimes your measurements aren't going to match up perfectly due to those variances if you're going, if you're drafting it out. So I laid out my whole project on a CAD program. I tend to do that on all of my things. That way I can duplicate them later and it helps me save me some of my headache as I go. Um, now, that doesn't mean I don't screw up. And when I mentioned this box, I changed it. There's a reason I did that. And that is because when I laid out the box, I laid it out at two foot, four inches wide. And we were trying to keep the proportions of the Headby box, but scale it up a little bit bigger. Um, the original Headby box is, uh, the dimensions is uh, 0.52 meters by 0.23 meters by 0.27 meters. And I had that written down in inches and don't remember what it was, but I want to say it was something on the order of like nine inches tall. And that's just a little too small for us for what we wanted to use it for. So we blew it up a bit. Um, I roughly doubled the size of the box to get it to a usable size and then tried to find lumber that would fit pretty close, but it's not exact. Um, I actually, my total height of my box, I would need a one foot, two inch board. And obviously I'm not gonna get that. So I'm gonna have to build that board out of my lumber. I've gone ahead and I've cut most of this up to give you an idea. So to do that, I've got my 11 and a quarter and then I ripped some other pieces off here and I'm gonna to attach those. Can I ask you to do something real quick? Um, can you turn off the light directly above you? Because it's it's whiting out the uh, the wood a little bit. Uh, yeah, just a second. He has everything on remote, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, except those are all on the same switch now. Oh, of course they are. So let's see here. <clears throat> yeah, that might work a little bit better. Maybe. Now I'm in the dark. Ooh. Well, I can see the grain, so. So one of the things that you're gonna wanna do when you're putting this together, and yeah, it is really hard to tell on this, is you're gonna wanna try and match your grain up somewhat. And when I say match your grain up, um, you're gonna have knot holes, you're gonna have variation in the grain as it moves. You want to try and get the grain on the two pieces as close as together as possible, as well as getting a good tight joint so that it is harder to tell where that joint is and it doesn't jump out as much at you. Um, I'm not gonna just glue this together. So I've cut these down. You can see on this piece here, there's a knot hole there. So when I can glue it together, I'm gonna actually glue it this way. I'm gonna check both my boards. I'm gonna find out the better face on the bigger side. Now, the reason I say that is because I'm also gonna be looking at the grain on the end of my board. And this particular board, I don't know how well you can see the grain here, but this particular board has got a lot of the pith of the tree in it. So looking at this way, it's curving this way, which means when I glue my other board on, I wanna flip it so that the grain of my second piece is going the other direction. So that instead of having a piece that's curving this way and a piece that's curving this way and a piece that's curving this way, all glued together, which has a greater chance of cupping up this way, they have a greater chance this way, if they do warp, they're going to kind of go more like this. They're gonna make more of a, like a sine wave and it'll stay a little bit, not necessarily flatter, 
but a little bit more in the same plane. So it's less likely to have this big curve sticking up. Now, to glue these boards together, there's a couple of things you can do. You can actually just glue them face to face. If you've got a good 90 degree angle on both of them, joint it, run it through the table saw, use a hand plane, however you're gonna do so. If you've got them, these are not, it's not a load bearing joint this way. Since this is gonna be the front of the box, all of the weight is resting down. So it's not as critical to make sure this is a super strong joint. However, if I was to do this on the bottom, like I'm gonna actually have to do because I screwed up, never do this stuff in a hurry, it never works. So I laid out my bottom of this and uh, I then made a cut in the wrong place and I actually had to slice it to add a piece to it. Happens to us all, you get in a hurry, measure twice, cut once. Sometimes that doesn't work for me as well, but it does happen. Um, and I'm kind of rambling here. So I'm gonna get back to this one here. So this is one kind of joint that I can use. Like I said, I could just butt it together, but I want it stronger. And in this case, since this is gonna be the bottom of my second box, I definitely want that to be a little bit stronger. Even though it's not likely to break in this small of an area and we're using them for garb, so it's still not as likely, I don't want to take a chance on them warping different ways. So then I've got my base sitting there and instead of being nice and flush, this side might be a little tight, that might be down. I don't wanna deal with that. So I'm going to put a mechanical or a, a, a joint in here of some sort. This is a, a hidden spline. And a spline is basically a piece of wood that is gonna go into both of them. And in this case, it's rectangular. It's a real, real simple joint. You do it a couple of ways. Um, for the top one here, I've just cut a channel all the way through. This will be hidden inside the wood. You won't see it anywhere, but I don't want it to show up on the outside of my box if I can avoid it. Since this is gonna be inside the wood completely, this larger piece has the tabs that will stick out. So what I wanna do is I wanna be careful and I wanna cut this without uh, cutting all the way to the end. And to do that, what I did is I laid out my, uh, my difference on my table saw so that I could start cutting this groove and then very carefully, I slowly lowered it down and then slowly raised the blade of my table saw up while this was clamped down. Once I had that, then I could unclamp it and I could slide it forward a little bit. It's not the most safe method of doing it, but it was a method that I had at the time. Uh, another way you could do it is you can actually use a router table with a, uh, a T-slot cutting bit in it. And again, set it up, mark where you want your cut your cut to start and where it ends and you can put stops in there. You can slide it in and go up until you've got a slice running down the length of it. But for those that don't have all of those tools, they can just glue it if they need to. You can just glue it. Um, everything, I mean, there's, <clears throat> there are always ways to get around what you do and, and don't have and ways that you want to make this happen. Spline is a really easy way to do it. You can just say to heck with it and run it through the table saw. It's not going to create a terribly huge noticeable thing. If you notice, that is about all that's there. And this, it's not really shown because this is going to be hidden. I didn't worry about it. If I was going to do this as a full length spline, all you would really see on the end of the box is you might see a tiny little joint there that is going to show up as a slightly different color of wood. It's not a big deal. And quite honestly, if anybody is looking at your project and going, oh, that is terrible, you've got a spline there, they can probably be asked to leave your tent because uh, that kind of input's not really necessary or helpful. I'm, I'm a little passionate about that. Now, there's another way that you can go about doing this, which is a purely modern way. Um, is that a plywood and, spline? Nope, that is not. That is a piece of uh, this pine, just like uh, I, I just cut an extra piece to the same the thickness and then I played back and forth with it. So it's just a, another piece of pine. I mean, it's just, just a little piece. Um, and it just, I cut it down. And then um, once I cut my, uh, my 
uh, grooves into the wood. I then went through with a hand plane to take a little off till it fit and then sand it a little bit and just kind of kept playing with it until I got a snug fit. You don't want a super tight fit. If it's tight, any moisture is going to cause it to swell and you have a greater chance of it splitting off the wood. And in this particular case, since we're looking at kind of a thinner channel here, that breaking loose, it, it, there's not, it's not as strong uh, as if it was uh, buried in there or if it was a thicker piece. So I want it and you can see it's, it's a little snug. It, it takes a little bit of work to get in and out of there, but I can do it by hand and it goes in. And it just, it's a matter of sanding it until it, it fits in there snug and you can go from there. So the other option for those of you who want an excuse to buy a new toy is, is called a biscuit jointer. And a biscuit jointer is a modern tool. Uh, there is nothing really like it uh, historically. And it's a modern invention for the modern problem, which is we need a wider board. So what a biscuit jointer is, is it is a handheld tool that has a circular blade that only comes out to a certain degree. And it causes a shallow arc cut to be cut. This is a biscuit joint. It's got a fence on the side here. So you can set a 90 degree. It's got marks here to show you where your center is. And it's got, as you said, a circular blade. If you can see that sucker. So what it'll do is it will come out, it will cut a shallow curve in there and put what are called biscuits. And these are biscuits. This is a number 10 and a number 20. When you see that, it refers to the sizes of the biscuit. And when you're using them, most biscuit joiners, if you look at this right here, there's that number, you'll see it says 20, 10, and zero. And that is the depth of the cut. And that is referencing the size of the biscuit. These are compressed fiber that will expand. And you can see two different sizes here. There's a 10, there's a 20. So they will go into the slots that you cut in the wood. And then when you put your glue in there, the glue has, not only will the glue expand the biscuit so that it fits in there nice and snug and tight, but it also means that instead of having just those two flat edges of the board glued together, you've now got a mechanical fastener going from one board to the other to connect them. Uh, it, it's very similar to a spline. It's just, uh, these are mechanically produced and it's a little bit easier to, to knock together. Another option for those who really want to put it in there is they have what they're called uh, domino joiners, I think. And that puts in something very similar, uh, except it is more, um, it's a slightly different shape. It's a proprietary tool to my knowledge from the Fest Tool Corporation. And I don't have one of those. Or you can use dowels. Uh, there is absolutely no reason you can line up your joints and you will then grab a pencil. Now I have one over here. Come on, too many tools. So I'll go over, I'll take my joint. Usually I'll measure it out. I'm just gonna eyeball here. So I'm gonna go across, I'm gonna make a line, gonna make another line, kind of split that in half. So then whether or not, now my lines are going across both boards. The reason for that is when you put it back together, this gets cut a bit of a, a, a wider slot. So sometimes they'll move. So you can actually be perfectly flush with your joint putting together, together, but the actual connection of the board might be off a little bit. So by having those lines as you're putting it together, you know it might mates up that way. The other reason to do it is uh, if you're using dowels, or if you're using the spline, the spline especially, it's just a straight line. So it helps you reference it, but it also helps you reference so that your biscuit cuts, or if you're using dowels, both are in the same spot, so they line up. And uh, one of the things we talked about is dowel centers in a previous show. So 
Here, it's really, really important if you're going to use dowels, you need to make sure that you are at 90 degrees to connect those going in and out because you don't want your two boards, if they're duly together, to come together at an angle. You want them to be nice and flat. Do you remember which video that was in? Uh, I believe it was the last one. Um, the very, I think the very last episode we talked about that, but I'm not 100% positive to be honest. Uh, we've had done a couple of them. But, most of your uh, stores, big box stores, whatever, this is a dowel center. And what it is, is it is a small piece that is a set diameter. You'll buy them in various sets. Usually you buy them in sets of two. Uh, this one's a half inch. So I drill a half inch hole. I would then slide it into my hole and it'll go in and it'll sit in and there's that lip around it that will keep it from going all the way in and there's that point. So when you put it in there, you put it in, it'll sink down flush, or oh, not flush, but close to there. And then I'll come in and I'll lay this down on the top, I'll push it down hard, and it will make an indentation to match up exactly where that hole is so that it, it goes from one board to the other and it transfers pretty well. And for those of you who wanna kind of look at that a little bit further, it's in the tabletop uh, it's in the tabletop video, which is number seven for Woodworking 101. Right. So now that we've kind of gone in depth into ways to get to join your boards together uh, to get a wider board, it's especially important for some of the things when you, you just you can't find those boards that you really want. Um, and uh, again, referencing back that tabletop video, uh, I wanted a 35 inch wide table or no, a 30 inch wide table and trying to find a board that wide is, is not gonna be really that easy. And it means I've got six five inch boards going across it. So having them connected mechanically means that they're less likely to stress and warp and pop and fall apart on me. Um, for your boxes, uh, if you need something bigger, you know, than the lumber you can find, or usually you can get it a little cheaper, um, by buying a, bo a board here and a board there and then gluing them together as you go. So it, it's kind of about trying to be economical. So once I've got that glued uh, and get it up to my size, next you got your layout. Now I've, I've said a couple of times here that I screwed up on this box. And the reason that I screwed up on that box is because of the angles. So the base of this box is two foot, four inches from the bottom side to the bottom side, whereas the top is two foot, two inches. So when I glued this together and I cut out all my pieces on it, I forgot to take that into account for my, my base piece there. And I ended up cutting my base the same size that I cut uh, that I laid out there. So I made my base two foot, four inches long. So it was too long. So this box is actually a little longer than I intended it to be, which means once I had gone through my cut list, I had cut all my pieces out. The uh, box was too, uh, the base is too long to allow them to go all the way. So I had to move that the front piece up a little bit to still maintain the angles. I could have just cut the base piece down a little bit and, uh, you know, gone with my initial numbers and all. But at that point, I just said to heck with it. And I went ahead and rolled with the punches and moved on. So once you've got your front piece glued up, or if you're going for dimensions that you don't have to glue it up, once you've got that piece cut, you're gonna wanna do your layout. All of the angles on this box are five degrees. It makes it really consistent. It makes it really easy. Everything is at five degrees, but it does take a little bit of thinking. So when you're laying out your box, we'll start with the sides. Now here they are, they're starting out rectangular. We're not going to put really much angle in the actual pieces here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go down and in this case, I have got a foot on here that set four inches up from the base. So I'm gonna come in here. I'm going to 
measure up from the base. I'm going to mark four inches. And I'm going to make a line. There are just a couple of lines on there. Now, I've got that four inches. You can measure the side. You can go across. However, the easiest way I have found, especially in this case, is just take a piece, especially if you've got an off cut, or I've got both of my feet or my legs here. So I'll come in here and I will mark it up. I will just lay the boards on top of it so I know exactly where it is. And using my fingers, you can usually feel with your fingers a lot more what the alignment is and how close it is than you can by measuring it. So I will go in there, I will do that, and I will use the thickness of the board itself to reference how much I need to cut off for that side. So now I've got that there. Now, this is a speed square. We've talked about them in the past. One of the lovely things here, if you can see these, is there's all these numbers on the side here. Those are dimensional lines. So instead of trying to measure it all out and figuring it, you can actually come in here, and drop everything today. And here is zero. Now, if I move this up until that five intersects the edge of the board, that's a five degree cut. So if you notice, there's a bit of a slant there. So there's my five degrees. So then I would go to the other side of the board, I would mark it, making sure that both of your angles are going the same way. There is nothing more frustrating than putting it on here, marking it, grabbing your board, flipping it the other way, and marking it and cutting it and realizing that on one side it goes this way and on the other side it goes that way. Not that I've ever done that, of course. So for there, this again, however your particular method of cutting it is, you want to stay just a hair away from that line. You don't want to go quite all uh, over the line. It should still be faintly visible there when you cut, just to make sure that you've got enough here. You can always trim it just a hair more if you need to. It also allows you to smooth it up, sand it, finish it, make sure that they all fit nice and snug together. In my particular case for this, what I'm going to do is I would then mark this on. Uh, I would measure my table saw, making sure that I am referencing the outside of the tooth. So hopefully you can see this. As I'm going, I am gonna make sure that when I lock this in place, this line is on this side of the tooth and not that side. Normally, if I'm looking at this and I'm gonna say, oh, this is three quarters of an inch, I'm gonna measure this face of the tooth against the fence. But since we're cutting you need this to adjust here, just a little bit. We can't quite see this. Oh, there we go. So the thing, if I'm gonna go here, normally when I'm cutting something, I'm measuring to this side. For this particular case, I'm going to this side. Also, you normally do not cut on the table saw with your thinner side in between. You normally cut so that anything that's coming off, anything that's coming off is to this side. We're not cutting all the way through. What we're gonna do is we are going to mark the front of where your, your blade is and figure out how far down you're gonna go. Need a second camera for this, I think. So here, if you'll notice, I'm just barely cutting. And if you'll notice, I've got a faint line right here. That is where the start of my blade at this height is cutting. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna go until I am at that line 
and I will do it like that. And then what I'll do is I'll actually come down and I will clamp a stop to my table saw blade down here so that I can't go any farther than this. If you're going to follow that particular method, you want to be really careful of kickback. Anytime you're using the table saw, you never want to stand directly behind the blade. You want to stand slightly off to the side so that as you're putting it in, if your workpiece gets kicked out, hopefully it's going to go completely by you as opposed to completely into you. Especially with these thinner pieces, they can come in and it can be quite painful. So in this case, I'm going to run it up against my fence. I am gonna go in there, I am gonna go gently until I hit my stop at the end. Once I hit my stop at the end, uh, uh, once I hit my stop at the end, uh, you can do a couple of things. If you're feeling really careful or gen or courageous, you can just carefully pull it back out or you can stop the blade, wait till it comes to a complete stop and then move it out, flip it and do the other side. That's generally the safer way. This is not the greatest method of doing it. A hand saw would be better, or you could use a circular saw for it, or a jigsaw also works, or a band saw. Um, it really depends on what you've got and what your comfort level with your tools is. From there, I will then switch over to my sled. I will mark out the height. I'll set it down and I'll just notch out that end and, uh, and take the end out. Was there a question? Yes. Um, do you ever use a bevel gauge to do the angle layout? I do, and uh, and I can. Um, and it's nice because even with a bevel gauge, I've talked about them before in some of the other classes, bevel gauge, you can set your bevel and you know that it's correct every time. Um, it is, got one right here. So for that, I can come over here and I can Loosen the nut so it moves a little easier. So I can come over here and I can mark it so that I've got uh, that correct angle on there. Ugh. I am dropping everything today. And uh, set it for, in this case, I would set it the opposite. So I would go to 85 degrees. And that'll give me that same. Number. Would it be 85 or 95 degrees? Because it's a five degree angle, correct? It is. Uh, it depends on what side you're uh, you're measuring at. Um, so in this case, I would be going at an 85 degree angle because it's going to be sloping up to me. So I've got much more of the wood here that is going to support my bevel gauge so that I can keep it in the right place. Whereas here, if I was going the other way, if I was going that 95 degree angle, I've got less of my bevel gauge resting on the wood, so it's a little bit more prone to moving. But either way will work. It really depends on what side of the board you're going. From here, again, I'm using that 85, and I'm on this back side, whereas if I was at 95 over here, it would be correct. As long as you've got that five degree angle, um, you're, you're good to go. Well, yeah, the, the difference of the five degrees. So either 85 or 95, you just want to be consistent on which way you're going with it. Um, I just use the speed square. It's, it's quicker for me. I'm used to it instead of pulling it out and setting my bevel gauge up and going from, you know, back and forth. The other thing is my bevel gauge is rounded on the top and most of them are uh, so that you pause here just a second. Notification. Um, so that it's harder to try and get that bevel gauge accurate on here because I'm, I'm going to the rounded edge. So where exactly do I stop at that five degree? Um, coming in here and I can mark it off. If I know where I'm starting, okay, I'm good to go here. Whereas with my speed square, for me, I set my foot up on the end of it. I rotate it until I'm at five degrees and I mark it. It's a question of comfort. One of the things I've really tried to highlight here is do what works for you. As long as you're getting the results, then the method is, is less important in this case, whether you're using a hand saw, whether you're using a power saw, um, whether you're, you know, I mean, you suppose you could use a chisel if you really wanted to do that much work. But um, 
I am more familiar with a speed, speed square. I spent uh, several years as a commercial carpenter and I carried this around with me and got my angles and measurements a lot more than I did with a bevel gauge. So it, it's, it's you know, familiarity. It's also one less tool for people to purchase if they're just starting out. True. Um, so, and this is just, speed square is just a lovely tool. Uh, I mean, you got your 90 degree built right in there. So you're good, you run a line. It's just, uh, it's one of my favorite, you know, go-tos just to have all around. So once I've done that, I've ripped this down. One of the things is with a circular blade is you're almost never gonna get a 90 degree cut on the face of the cut. As I'm running it through here, I'm 90 degree here. I'm 90, you know, I'm not most, uh, going side to side, but for this last area here, it's on the curve of the blade. So I'm gonna end up with a curved cut. So with that, you usually have a little piece hanging off, much like that. And if you look, there's about a half inch or so right there, but on the other side, there's like an eighth of an inch. So you got a little bit of a difference. Once I knock it off, what I end up with, if you can see that, is this kind of angled cut. To get rid of that, we're going to need a chisel. I don't generally keep a vise attached to my uh, workbench. I used to in the past, but I found that for the variety of tools that I work with and the variety of projects that I work on, half the time the thing was in the way or it wasn't in the right position. So instead, I just said, the heck with it. And in this case, I've got what's termed as a moxin vise or a double screw vise. There's a couple of screws that go in there. It opens and closes. I can clamp it down to my tabletop. And I found it just really, really handy for me for what I'm trying to do. It's also stuck over the edge. So like in this case, I've got this long board. I can put it at a convenient height to me. I can clamp that down, make sure it's not going anywhere, and grab a chisel. Pine is a very soft wood. It does not want to cut as much as it wants to mush. So I'm going to lay my chisel flat on this here, and I'm going to move it back and forth just a little bit so that it's trimming off those grains, it's paring the grain. And then I'm gonna come up here and I'm just gonna take a very thin slice off. And I'm gonna take several of them. The biggest mistake here is to get in a hurry and try and take too much off. It's better to take an extra few minutes to make small cuts, take small pieces off as you go, than it is to try and do it in a big hurry and take a big old chunk off and then you get grain tearing out on you. Also, sharp chisels are essential. The softer the wood, the sharper the chisel needs to be. Um, you can get away with a certain amount of um, blunt force with a hardwood, but softwoods just really want to, to mush. They don't wanna cut cleanly. So you have gotta use a sharp chisel. Also, a sharp blade is much less prone to causing injury than a soft bl blade because it's cutting. You're not forcing it through the wood as you go. Now I've come in and I've cleaned that up. You can still see there's that slant from the blade, but it is flat. My wood is going to joint up to it, nice and flush. If the wood is, there's no gap there that you can see. So, and it's just a couple of seconds to pare it down and make sure that it goes in there nice and snug. take. Now, this is soft enough and I'm taking a small enough cut that I can just put a little bit of body weight behind it and I'll cut it. Or I can grab my mallet. Again, metal rim, 
wooden mallet, metal on metal, tends to have a greater chance of producing a uh, splinters or breaking out. And I'm just gonna come in there and I'm gonna take off a little bit more, a little bit more. And these are about an eighth of an inch thick, maybe thinner. And I'm just making a bunch of them. Then I'll come in here, I'll cut them loose. until I get to the bottom. Then I'll come back in, I'll use my chisel. Now one thing, note, I don't know if you can quite see the detail, but I'm not just going straight in. I'm actually moving at a slight angle as I'm going so that the blade is cutting. I'm not trying to use the, the blade of the chisel to wedge it off. I'm actually using it, slicing it through to cut the fibers of the wood to get a cleaner cut. So once I've got my side cut, both of them done, I've got my angle on there. Now, if you are not comfortable cutting that angle, if you're using a table saw or something where you're gonna cut a 90 degree angle instead of that 85 or 95, depending on how you're cutting an angle, you can cut it square and then come back in. And just like I did here, you can clip it in, put your angle on there and use a chisel to put that bevel on it. Um, just again, this time you're cutting end grain, which is a little bit more difficult. Sneak up on it, take a little bit off, a little bit off, and just work your way back to that line. Don't try and take the whole thing off. It's gonna just give you a terrible result. You can get a lot of tear out, a lot of frustration. You just won't be happy with it. Woodworking is a game of patience and taking your time to get your results. Uh, shortcuts usually end up in frustration. So once I've cut that, I'm gonna go ahead and I would set it aside. And I'm now I'm looking at my front and my back. So for my front and back, again, I'm gonna use a speed square. In this case, I happen to have a 12 inches. So I'm gonna come in there. I'm gonna line it up at the very end. I am going to rotate down until I'm at my five, or you can use your bevel gauge. I'm gonna mark it off and now I've got my angle. So there's for my side. This is where a miter gauge comes in really handy if you're using a table saw. It has a dial on here. It's got quite a few different, you know, you can get a full range of degrees that go by in you know, single increments. You can do one, two, three, six, seven, eight. So I'm gonna set it at five degrees and then I'd run it through my table saw to rip it down to get those angles. That then gives me the reference to make sure that everything is starting to go together. Once I've cut both of those sides, I can reference my front and my back to make sure that everything is fitting together nicely and start going through and um, making sure that all my joints are tight, that I'm not off a little bit and pare it down if I need to. The One of the things to keep in mind is your bottom is still 90 degrees. We haven't taken anything off of here. That is one of the very last things I do. I will bevel the bottom and I will bevel the top so that the lid fits on there snugly, just in case something gets a little bit weird as I'm going along. So once I've cut those, the next step is gonna to be to actually put that tenon in your sideboards. Now, the reason that I go ahead and I do it the way I'm, I'm describing to you here is when I've set that here, it gives me an idea of where the bottom of this board is gonna be and it makes sure that everything is lining up. And it also is, I am saving my big boards. So if I make a mistake on my big board uh, that doesn't quite match up, I can take the, I have the opportunity of, if I need to, I can modify my smaller boards a bit to reflect the change on the larger board, or I have a smaller board that I need to replace to reflect what I did on the larger board. So I'll go through here and I've got that. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take a straight edge. and I'm gonna come all the way across. Now that line all the way across is the bottom of where those edges, those little ledges are. That is also gonna be the bottom of where your 
uh, base of your box is going to be. So that is where you need to do the layout for your tenon. Um, in this case, I ended up with a four inch tenon for my boxes. So I'm just going to go through and I am going to measure to the center of my box or my board, excuse me. And I'm just going to mark two inches off on either side. And then once again, I'm gonna take a piece of the board that I've already got. I am going to line it up with that line, make a reference. And that is how my layout for that tenon is gonna be. You can see where those hash lines are. That is what I'm gonna be, that I'm gonna to need to go through. I'll then flip it over. I'll do the same thing on that other side to make sure that it is even on that other side. And then I'll start cutting it out. There's a, a number of different ways you can do that. We've talked about that in other classes as well. Um, you can use a drill press or a, uh, a hand drill. You can drill out the bulk of that material and go down and so that most of it's gone. And then you can grab a chisel and pair up the edges. You can also grab a chisel and you can just start working back and forth to remove that material. So in this case, this will get a little bit loud. I'm gonna grab my chisel. I'm gonna put it in just slightly offset from the center of the board and give it a couple of taps. I'm gonna flip it around and I'm gonna go the other way. And then I'm going to bring it back just a little bit from that and do it again. And repeat on the other side. So what I've got here now is I've got this little cut and I've got these pieces in here that are starting to work their way out. And I will just start going back and forth and I will take it in and take it in and take it in so that each cut should be undercutting the cut that came before. I'll go till I'm a little bit more than halfway through and then I'll flip the board and I'll go in from the other side. And I will go down the length of the cut and then back down the other length of the cut, flip it over, repeat until you're gonna meet in the middle. And then what you'll end up with is you'll end up with a hole going all the way through that is kind of slanted on both sides. Then it's just a matter of cleaning that up. You can continue on with your chisel and you can go with a rasp to get it down so it's flat with that angle in there. You wanna try and make sure you've got it. If you don't, it's really not a terrible, it's not a deal breaker. You're gonna have a little bit of a gap, but you can work around that. One of the little nifty tricks is you get a ball peen hammer. And when you've got this end grain coming through, if you've got a little bit of a gap on it, end grain, you can see there's a little bit of gap there. End grain brooms really nicely. So if you've got a little bit of a gap, you go through and you take your ball peen and you just start tapping the end grain until it starts to go from being tight, kind of mushrooms out a little bit and it'll fill up that gap and then you can clean it up and it hides a lot of it. Um, so once you've got the side done, you're gonna then go back through and you're gonna go to your length and you're gonna go to your base and you're gonna cut it similar to what you did with the end with the, the legs. So once this is done, this is dry, this is glued up. It's not going together. You see, I've got tenons that are gonna go through on either side. And this is gonna come out, these will be at a 90 degree angle from the base. And you're gonna to wanna to put that five degree angle onto the edges here. Leave your tabs alone for right now. Trim those off once you get them through the wood. But this will go through, again, I'm cutting it off. Um, I'm gonna mark it down so I have a four inch tenon and it should fit your base pretty well. Then the last thing to do before you start looking at assembly is to put that little bit of a rabbit in the edge of your board. And there are a few ways of doing it. You can go with a rabbiting plane and just take a few passes, maybe go down about an eighth of an inch, just enough that it'll fit in there snug, but not be super tight. Uh, you can run it through your table saw on end if you're comfortable doing that. 
um, or you can go by chisel, but you just, you don't need a deep, deep rabbit in there. You only need about an eighth of an inch because all it's really doing is it's making sure that that side is sitting on top of that bottom so that it is nice and snug in there and it doesn't give as much of a chance of a gap. From there, you're gonna start assembling. And that is, uh, it, it takes a little bit of practice because you're on an angle. Normally what I'll do for something like this is I will take my sideboard and my legs and I will place my sideboard down flat on the table. Now I've got my angles to work with. And then I will take my legs that have already been cut and I will place them in place so that I am squared up and flush on there. I will then take my other sideboard, which should have also been cut, and I will put it on top. It's going to be a little bit wobbly here, but this gives you the chance to make sure that all of your lines are where they should be. Everything is squared up. Everything is meeting nicely. And from here, you can figure out where you're going to put your nails. I generally go about an inch down from the top and an inch up from the bottom, and then spaced out evenly with the rest of them. If you are using, especially this is a softer board and a, a, a wrought nail, these are squared nails uh, that I put away. So they are flat with a thickness to them and the rough looking head. They don't go in nicely. They are gonna go in there. They are gonna be nice and secure, but you have got to put a pilot hole in here. If you don't, you will split your wood. Uh, the size of the pilot hole is gonna depend greatly on the nails that you're using. For these particular ones, I am using the Rockler rot head nails. They are I'm using an inch and a half uh, long nails since this is about a three quarter inch. And uh, I am using a 332nd drill bit to drill down into the bottom. I'm also gluing my sides in. So I will draw them out, or I will or lay them out. I will pre-drill them, and then I'm going to glue the whole thing together and clamp it. Um, the wood, especially with this pine, I'm getting a lot of movement in it right now. Uh, our weather is changing a good bit lately. Uh, we had a foot of snow a week ago, and now we're just back to rain. So there's a lot of movement in the wood. And getting that clamping in there helps the glue to secure the whole thing as well and make it nice and solid. Once I've got, getting ahead of myself there, put your base in first too. That's kind of important because with that foot, it's not going to go. Um, so you put the base in, then you will assemble the top and the bottom. Got a little frazzled today. The carcass at that point is mostly done. What you're going to have is you're going to have a, an open top box. The lid is going to be really dependent on how you want to uh, attach it, whether you're hinging it or using battens to let it fit in there. But now is the time to do that fine tuning. So you've got things like your base is going to stick out of the side a little bit. That's when you're going to want to go in and like a low angle block plane is great for it take a little bit off, take a little bit off until your side is flat and flush with it. And this is also the point in time where you're gonna do your bottom. You're going to square those feet or you're gonna flatten those feet up so they're parallel to the ground. You're gonna take off that angle. So it sits nice, it's not moving. And you're gonna come up to the top as well. And you're gonna flatten that whole thing so that all of your angles are that five degree angle and your lid will fit on smoothly. Um, this one, I had some movement on it. It sat nicely the other day, but now I got a little bit of warpage, not a lot. So I might need to clean it up or not. We'll have to see. At that point, uh, like I said, you'll figure out your hardware. If you're going to put a hinge on it, you're going to go make some hinges. You're going to buy some commercial hinges and call it good. You can put a couple of battens on it so that it just sits in there and it doesn't move any place. And then it's a really question of choosing your finish. That is pretty much it. Um, we have talked about the six board box before, and there, this is, uh, it's really not that difficult 
except for that little bit of the angles. <clears throat> Excuse me. Making sure that you're remembering your angles and which direction you're going. Uh, and so you're not going to have, like I said, one side where the angle is this way, one side where the angle is this way. Um, they should all line up pretty well. And most of it's just a matter of small adjustments and taking your time. And uh, if it seems like it was fine a minute ago and it just isn't going together right now, stop, take a breath. Kind of go back and look at it and see if maybe you switch things up. Maybe you move the left leg over to the right leg position, or you've got a face backwards or something like that. Um, it's just little things that can kind of trip you up a bit. Hopefully I addressed a lot of questions that might be in there. I don't know if we have any others. If anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I don't have any right now. Okay. Do you want to talk about a little bit about finish, kind of what what you're going to do with it, or do um, you know yet? <laughs> we haven't really decided. As I said, these are probably going to be ones that we will uh, all finish up the other box, and uh, we tend to go for a, uh, a stain on a lot of them um, just to keep them all kind of a consistent color. Um, finish is uh, something, you know, it, it really depends on what you're doing with it and where you're going. I tend to use a, uh, a uh, exterior um, polyurethane um, uh, spar varnish. It has uh, UV inhibitors, so it protects the wood a little bit longer. And it also makes it, uh, it takes more of an abuse than a lighter finish, like an oil. If you're looking for something that might be a little bit, um, you know, more closer to a period possibility, you can go for an oil finish or you can go for a wax. But again, most of the time that we're finding these boxes, we're finding them bare, but uh, there are still traces of pigment on them. A lot of times it, they would have been um, painted or possibly carved rather than stained like we do nowadays. It really kind of depends on your personal preference. Is that an early period as well? There has been some examples of it. Um, if I am remembering correctly, one of the Osberg boxes, um, I, I want to say had some, um, no, actually, I think I'm thinking of the wrong thing. Yeah, I pretty much, the, I think I'm thinking of a, of a different box I was looking at related to something else the other day. Um, yet we don't find a whole lot of finish on them like we think of it nowadays. These were utilitarian objects, and whereas we tend to glorify the beauty of the wood, one of the prime factors for our ancestors was um, figures in the wood that make it interesting and pretty to look at would have made it harder to work. They didn't have the benefit of a power saw that would go through knot holes and things like that. So a lot of what they were doing was they were working with riven wood or would it have been um, split. So it goes for a thin, you know, tight grain, tight growth wood that splits easily, evenly and flatly. And, so it doesn't give a whole lot of interest to the grain itself. And your showing of your status of your wealth is in the intricacy of your decoration, at least later on. We don't know a whole lot about the earlier period ones. So it's really hard to draw conjecture. I'm not seeing any questions. Alrighty, well, I guess that means either I answered everything or I bored everyone to death. Um, but uh, that's what I've got for today. I'd like to thank everybody for showing up. And like I said, if you have any questions down the road or if you'd like to share your efforts, I'd love to see them. Um, you can find these videos through the, uh, the Early Sweden um, on Facebook and on YouTube. You can find my personal blog at um, sawdustandshavings.home.blog online where I cover a lot of this stuff in a little bit more in depth and uh, some other stuff that doesn't quite make it here. And if you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for future stuff, I'd love to hear from you. Well, somebody just asked a question. <laughs> um, what about handles? Uh, I have seen no evidence of handles whatsoever. That is part of one of the things as well, is uh, with this one, is, is it's a good height and a good size? You carry it under one arm. Um, they, I want to say there was some evidence on the Mastermere box that there were handles on it, but I am not 100% positive of that. 
but most of the rest of the pictures, if you've looked at them, there doesn't seem to be any indication that they had handles on them uh, originally. You can modify these a little bit if you want to take the bottom down here and cut a, uh, you know, a, um, cut like an arc or something in there so you can get your fingers under it and carry it from here, or you can carry it under your arm, uh, or you can just make sure that you have good friends who will take the other end and carry it around with you. That's true. I've I've had to rely on that quite a bit for my boxes. <laughs> Thank you so much for teaching today. Do you have any? Uh, do you do you know what plans you have for your next class? Uh, we talked about a few of them. Um, I have some things in the works. I don't have that list in front of me. And um, we've we've done. I think this is just the eighth or the ninth in the uh, kind of getting started series. The eighth the, class. Uh, the uh, eighth mm -hmm. class. Um, I, I have a few more, but I have also been uh, debating on taking a slightly different track and a different string of classes that are a little bit less in, uh, towards the historical and a little bit more towards the Skadian. Things like um, how to put together a box to hide your propane tanks at events and uh, to do so lightweight for there and things like hiding your um, stove, things along those lines more modern needs in a plausibly period manner, if you will. So, but stay tuned, we'll figure out what it is and we'll put it out soon. <laughs>